and off you go Emma. Excellent, um, yeah thank you very much everyone, uh, really nice to see you, um, thank you very much for inviting me um, to Vicky and the, and the Thames Valley Regional Group um, and I'm here to I guess to talk a little bit about field sketching and, and some of the parallels um, between the two parts of my sort of double life a little bit. Um, I can see there's a few people um, so far who've kind of typed in a little bit about their experiences with field sketching, whether you like it or don't like it, um, kind of uh, how much time you spent doing it in the chat. So kind of keep that up as much as you like. Um, I would definitely like to have a little bit of a, a dialogue as much as you can today. Um, and then we'll kind of open up the floor to kind of questions um, towards the wrap up as well at the end. Um, so kind of while, while people are doing that, I guess um, as much as anything, I should start off with my quote unquote qualifications. Um, oops, there we go. Um, uh, so just a little bit about kind of why I spend so much time thinking about this. Um, so my day job is that I'm a sedimentologist at BP. Um, I have been for um, uh, 10 years now, I suppose. And um, I currently work in, um, in deep water gas developments, but I've worked across um, uh, carbon capture and storage and a lot of different um, depositional settings as well. Um, but alongside that, for most of that time, um, I've been a practicing landscape artist, um, a mixture of um, self-taught and formally taught. Um, I did a, a, an HNZ um, part-time over the last few years and I studied part-time at the Royal Drawing School. Um, and also, um, it says founder, but that's really a fancy way for saying that I'm just kind of running these classes by myself. Um, I run a project called the Draw Out Project, um, and it is um, a way to combine um, uh, getting adults into natural history museums and science organisations through um, the, the art route instead of through science. So I feel a lot of the time like um, by doing kind of science outreach in science language, um, we often um, communicate with people who've already got kind of uh, uh, an affinity for science. And so kind of running a lot of experimental drawing workshops in museums, as well as drawing workshops like this one. Um, well, this isn't a demonstration one, but um, classes and workshops for geologists um, to get people to think about science a bit differently. And um, field sketching is like my number one love, really. Um, so there's some contact information there. I'm happy to pass it on at the end if you'd like to um, do any follow up or anything like that. Um, but just to kind of show you really briefly, um, and I can't get this far at the bottom off. Um, so we might be missing a couple of captions, my apologies, um, but a little bit about my work. It's largely um, geologically inspired, unsurprisingly, what, what could be more inspiring generally. Um, but um, I did a lot of my learning in um, the classical tradition or the Italia tradition, which involves um, like the lower image, a lot of drawing of um, casts, life drawing, um, figure drawing of any sort. Um, and there's a very rigid and traditional approach to observational drawing, which is what I'd like to show a little bit of the secret self um, to you guys today and, and kind of um, parallel that with how we think about um, uh, field sketching and, and observation in geology. Um, so just a brief note um, as we go along, um, there it, I did uh, just notice not too long ago that I should probably include a little bit of a content note here and that is just to say that um, because this talk um, discusses the classical art tradition, um, it does include some images of unclothed figures using traditional art teaching. So I'm not talking about rude drawings, I'm talking about life drawings um, by old master artists. Um, if this isn't for you personally, um, either drop out now or um, I've included slide numbers on all of the slides um, and I can give you advance warning of when, when those images are. Um, so the, the slide numbers are documented there. Um, like I said, nothing rude or anything like that, but if you weren't expecting to see a bum, uh, I thought it might be worth giving you a bit of notice. So um, this is what I'm going to discuss today, um, some of the, the main topics that I'm going to um, touch on, um, a little bit of discussion about um, what, why we do field sketches, you know, it might be pretty obvious to, to a lot of people, but it is worth a bit of exploration. Uh, and I'd be interested in your thoughts in the chat as well as we go. Um, and why so many people dislike drawing them so much. Um, I'm then going to kind of take a bit of a, a, a side, um, a bit of a, a tangent into um, some of the history and traditions of observational drawing and how what is pretty much a science has developed. Um, we're then going to kind of bring it back to, to field observations, think a little bit about the, the neuroscience um, behind um, learning to look um, that underpins both observational drawing and uh, field observations for geology. They're very similar actually. 
Um, I'm then going to get into um, a bit of a chunk where I'm going to walk through, I think, three exercises, um, which are some quick, um, useful techniques that geologists can borrow from artists. They are not something that's requiring of um, practice or anything like that. They're just kind of um, little extra tools to have in your arsenal if you are um, approaching field sketching that might kind of reduce the, um, the not the fear factor, that's a little bit dramatic, but you know, reduce that inhibition and make it a little bit quicker um, to get some of these outcrop sketches in. Uh, and then finish with a little bit of a manifesto um, for how we can improve field teaching um, by, by using this. Um, so normally I would run this as a workshop. Um, today it's just a talk. Um, so normally I would kind of have some draw along sessions in it where you could see me kind of carrying out the exercises and draw along. Today it's just a talk and I've expanded some of the art history elements of it as a result. Um, however, I actually don't know how long this is going to run. I've got about 35 slides in it. Um, so we do have a, a short um, additional about seven or eight slides um, that we can include if, if time allows, which is um, a little bit about how geoscience turns up, not in traditional landscape painting or anything like that, but how some of the concepts of geoscience are showing up in the work of 20th century and contemporary fine artists. Um, so that's a bit of an optional extra. See how we get on for time. Um, and also let me know um, in the chat if, if you want me to do it or not, or if you'd rather kind of um, wrap up with, with a bit of discussion. No problem either way. Um, so I guess we could start um, with kind of why do we do field sketches? And, you know, um, because you get told to at university is, is maybe one part of it. Um, but when I'm thinking about um, how I experience um, working with a subject through drawing, um, there's a few elements that I think um, kind of are useful and so, you know, um, uh, a few specific topics about thinking time as much as anything. Um, so yeah, the first is basically just say that, you know, um, somebody's already said um, that they only have time for photographs a lot of the time. And, and, you know, sadly that is true, especially if you're trying to crack through a lot of field sites in a day, or, you know, you're trying to visit a lot of um, different concepts within a day. Um, but the level of engagement and the level of um, learning that you can obtain from an outcrop um, is much greater when you're spending the time to make a drawing of it. Um, additionally, um, when you're looking at a photograph, it can be, um, you know, you get all of the visual information at once. Um, when you're working with a field sketch and, and certainly hopefully after you've um, gone through some of the exercises that I'm describing today, um, what they do is allow us to progressively pick out levels of detail. So, you know, it's much more natural to break it into large chunks and then refine those into um, the, the smaller scale um, structure or sedimentary structures associated with the outcrop. Obviously, there is um, a, a choice element incorporated in working with field sketches. Um, you can highlight significant or relevant features and ignore those that aren't relevant. There's a, a bit of a boundary there in terms of observation versus interpretation. Um, you don't want to exclude things because you think they're not relevant when actually later you think maybe I should have included some observations there. But I think we can all agree that for the purposes of geology, uh, your trees uh, are a little bit less relevant. Um, and then there's a, a memory element, you know, depending on how you learn uh, and how you form memories. If you're quite a visual learner, for example, um, working with a sketch is much more likely to be memorable. And there's a lot of um, uh, literature about um, how we can uh, more effectively form memories by drawing out what it is that we see. But that's a lecture for another day. Uh, and finally, um, let's be honest, most of the photographs we're taking at the moment stay on your phone. Um, and if we are taking uh, annotations, other observations, it can be quite hard to keep those together in terms of a documentation. So I'd be interested, again, you know, if anyone has any comments, please do drop, just drop them in the chat as we're going. Um, but if there are additional points of value um, that field sketches have for you beyond this, um, that it would be worth picking up on and I'm happy to kind of read them out as we go. Um, but I think we can all agree if we're all here um, that we all think field sketches are pretty important. And there was a comment uh, in the chat that said um, that a, a sketch can tell a story. And I think that's absolutely right. You know, it's a little bit about that kind of highlighting of significant features. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a much more um, measured way to engage with an outcrop. And when I tell people that I talk about um, field sketching from an artistic lens, um, 
the most common uh, response that I receive is that oh, it, it doesn't have to be artistic. A lot of people say it doesn't have to be artistic. This isn't an art project. It doesn't have to look good. Um, and I agree. Um, so there's an example here of um, a couple of um, sketches from uh, the Open University Field Guide um, with, you know, you can agree kind of different levels of, um, I don't even want to say aesthetic value because I don't know that that's true, but um, certainly one is, is more detailed and more kind of conventionally aesthetic than the other. Um, but if they both get down the key pieces of information that are important, um, preserve the uh, observations in the correct geometries and the co correct re relationships to one another, um, then that's fair dues, really. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we spend a lot of time making, you know, beautiful sketches just for their own sake, although it is kind of fun. Um, but um, what I do find is that um, when we are talking about field sketching, and I've got a quote uh, on, a, on a subsequent slide, um, the, the actual act of making a drawing, you know, we, we get kind of marched out to the first outcrop on our first um, field trip at university, and, um, and we get told to draw it, and then we get told a lot of information about how to record accurate observations, um, and a lot of conventions for field sketching because geology lecturers generally aren't art teachers, you know, so the best um, most of us can do um, is, is point at something and say, okay, draw that, and then we'll do some work with it. Um, but I do find that this has knock-on effects. Um, I don't know what um, your experience, experiences are in your academic or professional um, uh, lenses, but when I talk to my colleagues uh, about field sketches and about lectures like this, a lot of time um, folks are saying to me, oh, I hate field sketches, or oh, I never do field sketches, or oh, I'm rubbish at drawing, and things like that. And, and I think it does um, reduce the amount of value, um, as I've already described, um, that we can take out of an outcrop. So I think, you know, there is a, there is a limit um, there. Um, so what I'm not intending to talk about today is um, appropriate notation techniques. So this is something that, you know, is done very well as a rule. Um, uh, in kind of um, textbook settings and in um, uh, educational settings. So now I'm not going to be telling you about, oh, it's always better to have a scale and an orientation. We all know that. Um, and there are some really useful guides. Um, the one that I've kind of included there, if you just um, uh, Google search for the title or something like that, um, you'll find it uh, freely available online. But it's a very good guide to, um, you know, different approaches for annotation and mark making, um, textures, things like that, um, which are really useful. But um, and I'm afraid it's been cut off by my um, unhelpful um, uh, screen at the moment. But um, the, the quote that you can see at the bottom is uh, not picking on Royal Holloway. I've got a collection of these, but uh, a line from the Royal Holloway um, field guide, um, which says kind of for the drawing element, basically just says, uh, draw a reasonably accurate outline of the style and of the boundaries of the exposure. Um, and then the rest goes on to say and, and fill it in. Um, and, you know, like I said, fair dues, but um, reasonably accurate um, is something that, you know, um, a lot of people have trouble with. Um, and, you know, I think there's something we can, um, something we can expand on there a little bit. How do we get to reasonably accurate? So um, finally, um, you know, just noting down some quotes that people have said to me when I've asked them, how do you, you know, how do you experience field sketching, but also things that I've heard, I teach a lot of beginner drawing uh, for non-geologists. And, um, you know, I hear a lot of the same things the, the whole time, you know, people say, I don't know where to start, the pencil doesn't do what I want, which is quite interesting. Um, I, you know, I can never get the proportions right, can't fit it on the page, um, end up redoing it a whole bunch of times. Um, and I can tell you that if you um, attend uh, any kind of drawing class that um, deals primarily with observational rather than kind of experimental or expressive drawing, um, a lot of these issues will be dealt with in, in the first hour. Um, and the first time that I noticed that there was um, a real valuable parallel here uh, was when I realized what was going into this science of drawing, um, a very familiar topic uh, in geology underpinned these, which is observation versus interpretation. Um, so we all, we know, we, we talk about this all the time as geologists. Um, it's a, it's a central pillar, um, of geological thinking. We can all say the beds dip to the south. We can all say the beds are red for some value of red. Um, but if you ask 10 geologists why, you'll get 20 different answers because we are trained to separate our observations from our interpretations. 
Um, and it's a really, I think we uh, underestimate um, how much uh, uh, other, other scientists, other people kind of aren't taught that in such a rigid way. Um, it's very, very useful actually for drawing. Um, and field sketching is in service of observations, not interpretation. Um, if we do a field sketch and we bias our interpretation based on what we think is happening geologically, as soon as you get one piece of conflicting information, uh, as soon as you leave the site, then uh, you're really going to have to go back uh, and revisit. So um, which, what we're trying to do here is stop our brain, and it's something we're trained to do again, and stop our brain from sort of jump into these conclusions, jump into the interpretation. Um, it's something, like I said, that artists have been thinking about for much longer than modern geoscience has been around. Um, so why don't we ask them um, kind of how they've been doing it? Um, so a bit of a, a sidetrack now, um, thinking about um, the, the traditions um, of observational drawing and how they came about, a little bit of art history for you. Um, so what's called the classical or the atelier fine art tradition um, is this very rigid um, observational drawing approach, um, kind of very uh, do the same thing uh, 20 times, 100 times, you're not allowed to go on to the next thing uh, until you've mastered that one. It's, it's, um, it's a very traditional approach. Um, I, I really enjoy it, although it is thinking hard work, especially at the beginning. Um, but the tradition is very old. Um, it dates from the Middle Ages. Um, it kind of reached its height. Uh, in the 19th and 20th century. Um, originally, the atelier was an artist's workshop where um, an artist would take on uh, a number of students at different levels of experience, you know, maybe uh, one every few years. And they would do um, very basic pieces of work for, an artist, for the artist themselves to then work on top of, um, to finalize, to kind of finesse a little bit. Um, and um, by doing that, they would learn the kind of basic building blocks um, of drawing. So it, it developed out of a very apprenticeship led approach, some, somewhere between a, an apprenticeship and a, and a factory line, really. Um, however, um, what kind of I'm talking about uh, in these terms as, as the, the proper uh, quote unquote atelier, which you can see a couple of examples here, um, was developed in the 19th century. And, and um, you can still find um, modern ateliers today. Um, there are a few in London, for example, and, and quite a lot of them do online courses these days. Um, but we'll have this very rigid approach where you will do cast drawing for as much as a year working in black and white. And by cast drawing, I mean um, casts of statues, um, uh, statue drawing. Um, you know, if you go to the cast court, the Victorian Albert, for example, it's, it's full of these kinds of models. Um, so you do cast drawing um, for as much as a full year, just working in black and white, just tone. Um, and once that is fully mastered, you move on to drawing the human figure um, and drawing the human figure initially again in black and white. So um, charcoal or pencil mediums. Um, and only when that's been mastered will color theory be introduced. So it's this, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty hard work. Um, in terms of how drawing is taught in contemporary art schools, um, it tends to be an elective option these days because contemporary art has evolved quite a lot and so much of um, contemporary art is more about um, taking apart art to find out how it works um, rather than on, on um, direct visual representation. But that being said, um, observational drawing um, uh, is still a pretty uh, fundamental piece of, of 20th century and some contemporary painting and drawing. Um, as I'm going to expand on in the next few slides, um, this idea of learning to look by doing um, direct and solid observational drawing uh, underpins um, even the most um, abstract artists. So um, at the bottom, you can see an example there of um, uh, a very famous um, set of um, training drawings called the Barg, 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 I have no idea actually, maybe French, um, lithographs. Um, and one of Picasso's copies of it, Picasso, um, uh, is was uh, a very um, experienced draftsman um, before pushing the boundaries of art at the time. Uh, and then the other two examples here you can see are um, the early student work of the abstract expressionist Lee Krasner um, and the work that she went on to do, um, which again was kind of very, very um, abstract. So um, people like her husband, you know, Jackson Pollock, um, who's quite a famous example of people saying my five-year-old could have done that well, you know, give me a drink uh, and say that to me uh, and you'll get a, a heck of a lecture. 
Um, because a lot of this is about um, understanding um, how to look and how to really pull apart your observations. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamental principle uh, of most representational art and, and abstract art um, even today. Um, but um, when we talk about the development of observational drawing, um, those of you who kind of describe themselves as uh, being rubbish at drawing or anything like that, um, might be surprised to hear that it's not in it at all. Um, I firmly believe there's no such thing as talent in drawing. Um, it is um, a science and it was developed as a science across a number of different cultures through history, um, depending on its importance to that particular culture. So for example, um, uh, in Egyptian um, uh, artwork of, of um, mostly tombs, obviously, is what's preserved. Um, things like perspective simply weren't important. Um, so the relative size and positioning of objects um, and people was relative um, to their importance, um, rather than, because that was kind of the, what was needed to be communicated. Um, and you can see an example here of um, a Roman um, uh, villa painting uh, from Pompeii, um, which uses very basic, um, what you call one point perspective. So you can see here, hopefully you can see my mouse, um, but you can see here that um, some of the uh, important uh, lines, like the edges of the, um, the plinths here or the, um, the villa or whatever it is behind, maybe a temple or something, um, they, they do dissipate to a single vanishing point. So there were some ideas, people were playing with ideas of observational drawing very early, but they came and went. Um, obviously, you know, there was less communication at the time. And so things like single point perspective um, subsequently va vanished basically until about the 15th century. Um, as a couple of other uh, examples, um, uh, Chinese um, drawing depended very heavily on something known as aerial perspective. Um, Chinese artists never developed, um, or kind of um, historic Chinese artists, sorry, um, and traditional drawing never really developed um, any ideas of direct perspective because the majority of uh, Chinese art includes landscape. And really what's the point in perspective when everything's wiggly lines anywhere? Um, so instead um, there, were, there were developments of something known as aerial perspective, which was subsequently um, rediscovered effectively by Leonardo da Vinci where the amount of weight and contrast in the foreground, um, so you've got much darker lines and you've got much kind of um, more detail in the foreground uh, with the background being pushed back by kind of uh, mid-tones and um, uh, much less detail. Uh, or finally, um, probably one of my favorites, the very first example of foreshortening um, is on something called uh, the Three Revelers Vase by Euthymides. Um, so this is a Greek uh, redware vase um, where you can see that this guy in the middle um, is, um, is uh, turned three quarter to the view. And this is the first time that this has ever been observed. So it wasn't something that people needed very much. Um, and inscribed on, I think, the bottom of this vase is, um, I think, quite funny. Um, uh, Euthymides wrote, um, as never Euphronius could do. Um, across the bottom of this vase. So he's kind of sassing off one of his uh, contemporaries at the time. Um, he was obviously very proud um, of this early development of foreshortening, um, this kind of, uh, kind of three quarters view, which is, you know, again, not in it. It's not something that people um, automatically know. Um, most of this um, was lost um, at some time or another. Like I said, aerial perspective rediscovered by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, the School of Athens is um, another example of um, that single point perspective, which was all the rage um, back in, in, the, in, the, in the 15th, 16th century, um, as it was being effectively rediscovered. And um, both um, in, in Northern and in Mediterranean Europe um, during the um, kind of Renaissance effectively, a lot of these techniques were being rediscovered. And, um, particularly north of the Alps, um, there was a lot of um, pretty scientific literature on how to develop um, ideas of perspective and observational drawing um, and, and building on each other's work in a way that we would recognize as, as pretty academic. So why am I telling you all this? What can Michelangelo teach us um, as, as geologists? This is one of my uh, favorite quotes and goes a little bit back to some of the things that um, geologists are saying about um, why they don't do field sketches. My uh, uh, my, the pencil doesn't do what I want, um, you know, I can, um, I'm holding the pencil wrong or I don't know what I'm doing or anything like that. 
Um, and basically the core principle of everything that I'm going to say to you from now on is um, encapsulated in this Michelangelo quote, which says, an artist must have his measuring tools not in the hand, but in the eye. Um, you know, we can say as much as we like about how to hold a pencil, but um, I get my students a lot of the time to do observational drawing with their non-dominant hand, with their feet, uh, with a pencil tape to a big long stick. Um, and you can still get really exciting drawings because um, the key um, for both geology and the idea of observation and interpretation and fine art, as I'm going to expand on now, um, the key is in our ability to look accurately and really look at what we're seeing instead of working from assumptions. So what do I mean by this? Um, so uh, if anyone knows um, anything more than the uh, couple of articles I read about this, my apologies. Um, but some ideas um, about the, the neuroscience behind um, bad drawing, and it's all to do with um, what makes up most of our brain, about 80% of our brain, um, called the neocortex. Um, so we are, um, the reason we have so much evolutionary advantage is that we are pattern seekers. The neocortex, the wrinkly bit of your brain, um, is entirely organized um, around groups of neurons that are designed to take um, stimuli, uh, visual information, um, auditory information, whatever, uh, and turn it into a pattern that we can work from. Um, you know, to, to kind of use a more concrete example, that would be looking at, um, you know, some berries and knowing that they're poisonous because they're red or um, looking at those kind of weird shapes over there and being able to uh, immediately turn those weird shapes into uh, some eyes and a mouthful of pointy teeth and know to run in the opposite direction. Um, so, you know, our ability to um, recognize patterns is so fundamental and innate to us um, that we, we don't even realize we're doing it most of the time. And, you know, um, it's, it's pretty well known that um, uh, computer algorithms still can't um, replicate the ability to do pattern recognition um, that we can as people recognizing faces, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we've got a whole lot of brain matter and a, a whole lot of body dedicated to keeping it alive where its whole job is just to turn visual information into an interpretation. Um, so what happens when this goes into overdrive a little bit? Um, this is a, a phenomenon that I think everybody knows um, whether they know the name for it or not, which is, um, Apologies if I'm pronouncing this wrong. I've only ever seen it written down. Um, par par parado paradolia. Let's give it a go. Um, which is um, the incorrect perception of visual stimulus as an object. So that might be, you know, usually it's faces, right? And we're all used to seeing really funny faces in, um, you know, lots of different settings. The uh, the Cookie Monster geode went round last year. A lot of geology social media. Um, but um, it's really hard to unsee these. It's really hard to not see these um, faces and it is really hard to get them unstuck once you've seen them. Um, you know, your brain is just automatically going, that's a face, that's a face, um, because we're so used to recognizing so many faces and our, and our brain is, is so well trained on them. Um, so pattern recognition can go a bit wrong or can get a bit overzealous sometimes. And this is what happens in drawing. Um, so when you are starting out as an artist, and I'm going to show you some examples of quote unquote bad drawings in a moment, um, when we're working from a recognizable shape like a face, um, you know, we know what, what the fundamental plan of something like a face is. Um, we generate the pattern, something like um, figure A here, generate a symbol in our mind when we first observe the shape. Um, and then it is so, so easy. Um, to start working from your um, brain's kind of symbol of what a nose is, what eyes are, rather than um, actually working from what we see in front of us. Um, and you can draw a really clear parallel with field sketching there in terms of as soon as you think, right, that's a fault, um, and the, these are the faults that are antithetical to it, you might find yourself drawing, um, you know, them coming in at the angle you expect to see them coming in. Uh, rather than the, uh, the angle that you're actually um, viewing. And that's where you lose some of the value of direct scientific observation when we're working from assumptions. Um, but yeah, drawing is, you know, is a really, uh, a really familiar place for this kind of idea of symbols. Um, and they're not perfect, right? It's not an accurate representation. It's a shorthand for what we're seeing. Um, and it's basically our brain being pretty lazy, basically. And so just to kind of um, kind of uh, expand on that parallel a little bit, here are some examples of um, 
low mark student work from the um, OCR A-level mark scheme for some field sketches. Um, and the description of why these are low mark examples is basically saying um, that they are um, textbook examples. You can see um, if their only um, experience is technical illustrations in textbook, they'll try and draw textbook examples. Um, so, you know, this doesn't look like any particular bivalve. It looks like a pretty um, uh, model bivalve. And similarly, um, this uh, outcrop drawing has more to do with uh, what you would expect to see than um, what might be truly there. Um, and that's true for drawings as well. Here are some examples of, of bad, quote unquote, bad drawings. You can see they are from a bad drawing website where people post their own bad drawings. I would never say that um, about someone else's work. Um, but there are some really good um, illustrations here. You can see how the eyes are being drawn as symbols. Um, you know, look at your own eye in the mirror and it, it never looks like this kind of big lemon shape. Um, but that's that, that brain laziness um, coming into it. And similarly, the, this sweet little dog's tail. Um, in our brain, dog's tails stick out. You know, you like to see a dog wagging its tail. Um, but actually, in the image that's being copied, that's not true at all. And we instead have this kind of semicircle um, there. So again, working on assumptions, getting lazy, instead of really learning to look. Um, and artists have been um, subverting this for a really long time. So how to get away from this, I guess, is what you know um, we're asking at the moment. People, you say, you say in Emma, um, uh, you know, I know, I know all of that, or that seems very obvious to me. But how do I stop doing that? And certainly, how do I stop doing that without um, many years of, of drawing experience when it's just not something you'd rather do with your evenings? Um, and all of the tricks that I'm going to show you in the next section are about removing the brain's ability to find that pattern and to, to removing the brain's ability to jump to conclusions. Um, so it's as we break down um, a subject, whether that's an outcrop, a still life or portrait, breaking it down into abstract shapes, our brain doesn't have a symbol to revert to. Um, and you can get such an accurate um, drawing. Um, I always recommend for scientists um, this book. Um, it's an absolute classic. Um, it's been in print for kind of 30, 40 years. Oh gosh, even longer. Um, called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain um, by Betty Edwards. It's a very scientifically um, and kind of academically laid out drawing course um, and it has incredible results. Um, and I use a lot of the exercises in my own teaching. But the very first thing, um, or one of the very first things um, that she gets students to do is to reproduce this Picasso line drawing, but to do so right way up and then to do it upside down. Um, and complete non-artists and beginner artists are absolutely amazed at their ability to draw hands, draw accurate faces, get proportions accurately, because instead of um, seeing a man here, um, it's pretty easy to um, see this instead as a collection of, of weird abstract shapes that we don't have any um, reference for. So yeah, the upside down Picasso, and, and I'll send these slides around if you'd like them, you probably need to PDF them because it's quite a big pack. Um, but um, give it a go if you fancy, or, or definitely look for this book, which is um, pretty cheaply available um, in, in most good bookshops. And how quickly does it work? Um, so this is an example uh, from uh, the Betty Edwards course. Um, this is um, when she teaches this in person. Um, I would just like you to know um, that these are two self-portraits drawn from life, not from a photograph of the same person. But just look um, at the dates on them. This is dated July 8th, 2019, and this is July 12th. Um, so by applying some of the things that I'm going to describe in a moment, um, she is, uh, is, it, is it deeper? I think it says deeper. Um, deeper has been able to move from working from, from symbols um, to working by breaking in a, a, a drawing down into abstract shapes. And you can see, you know, in, in how the eye is visualized or, or the mouth in particular, she's gone from a, a symbol to a real three-dimensional object based on learning to look. So what does this mean for field sketching? If we can apply some of these, it, um, we can use these methods. It will improve our drawing ability, which um, means we make more field sketches. We make them quicker, we spend less time messing about, rubbing everything out and going back. Um, and it improves the objectivity, you know, um, by recognizing when we're making these brain assumptions, um, we, can, um, we can kind of um, spot it before it happens, I guess, a little bit, and actually get better quality field sketches without actually having to uh, improve the aesthetic value of them, for whatever value of aesthetic um, you want to include. So I'm just going to step through three of these now. 
um, their art historical context um, and, and how we can use them. So the first is negative space. Um, negative space is a concept uh, you might have run into before. Um, it basically means the space around objects. Um, so here is an example um, of the space around a still life. Uh, and while I can tell you, uh, for one, drawing cups or bowls, spheres, anything like that is um, a nightmare. Um, actually being able to identify and draw this shape is a much, much easier way to get um, everything into its accurate place. Uh, and this space exists everywhere. It's not just kind of uh, around objects. You know, you can use different, um, use different objects and take them out of context. So here, the head is one and the entire figure is another. And then suddenly we have additional pieces of sort of weird contextless, contextless shapes to work from. And you can apply this to outcrops too. So, um, you know, uh, whether you're looking at the skyline, um, it's much, much easier to be um, drawing this shape around. Um, and if you're, you're thinking, where are the top boundaries? Give me a moment. It's much, much easier to be drawing the shapes around an outcrop than it is to be um, measuring a really complicated, multi pinnacled form uh, and trying to draw the shape itself. Um, I've got a worked example for you in a moment. And again, the vegetation uh, and, and kind of fallen blocks and things like that might again kind of help you to approach the boundaries in a different way. Um, for your question um, that I'm kind of hypothetically raising, which is, OK, but, you know, the sky doesn't really have boundaries like this. Um, a very useful and underused tool for a field geologist might be a viewfinder. Um, you can just make one out of the back of a cereal box or um, a picture frame mount um, and it can go in your field notebook and they are incredibly useful um, because you can uh, draw around the inside of it um, to have like a, the right um, aspect ratio of kind of shape, you know, a width to length, uh, width to height ratio. Um, and then you can hold it up to the landscape and actually um, either mark on or, or just kind of visualize where the intersections um, of an outcrop are with um, your viewfinder. And then you can literally cheat, put that back down on the paper, transfer those lines onto, um, uh, onto your sketch. Uh, and suddenly you have a frame for that, um, with, again, with apologies to Royal Holloway, that reasonably accurate outline um, is easier to approach. And of course, you can also work from this negative space. Um, you also have this negative space. So you've got a whole bunch of shapes um, that are much more uh, removed from their context. So here's a worked example. Um, so these um, outcrops are virtual outcrops taken from the virtual outcrop project, um, University of Aberdeen, and um, I think it's a Norwegian um, consortium. Um, would definitely recommend having a look. Um, it is a fantastic resource, especially while we're all stuck at home. Um, and pretty much done that. So spend a little bit of time um, kind of uh, sketching a very small thumbnail um, just to kind of understand this really complicated shape. Um, laid it on the paper as a, as a number of um, negative spaces and then filled in everything within it. Um, and uh, for, your, um, for your fun, uh, you can kind of maybe notice a little bit on uh, comparing this to this, exactly the point at which my brain got lazy um, and wasn't able to um, uh, replicate part of this accurately. So um, yeah, prizes for who can spot that one. Secondary, uh, secondarily, um, the site size method um, is another really useful tool that we can co-opt as geologists. Accurate proportions are incredibly challenging uh, and remain so for pretty much everyone until you're a very experienced artist, much more experienced than me, um, particularly for anything that is very long and skinny. Um, whether that's a stand-in figure uh, or a very long cliff outcrop, we have a tendency to um, exaggerate um, the kind of either make the figure shorter and fatter or make the um, outcrop taller to kind of um, enhance that aspect ratio. Um, and the site size method, it's very controversial, believe it or not, um, is uh, a method used in um, uh, contemporary atelier settings. Um, I won't go into why it's controversial, but it's just people saying like, that isn't how we used to do it and stuff like that. Um, where you are viewing something on your paper or your canvas at exactly the same scale as you see it um, to your eye. So what I mean by that is like, if you were to look at something that's off in the distance, measure its um, 
uh, kind of, uh, what's the word, like angular resolution, I suppose, in what you're looking at, then transfer that image directly to the paper. Um, it really can help us. And I'm going to expand on that now. Um, we use a pencil for the most part. So if you've ever seen someone in an art gallery or, you know, felt like a bit of a, a what's it uh, doing this with your pencil, uh, this is why it gets done. Um, by holding a pencil at arm's length, um, arm's length being a fixed distance from your face, um, you can either uh, use the kind of the top of the pencil and your thumb um, to measure the, um, the, the angular resolution, the, the height of what it is you're looking at, and then transfer that directly to your paper. Or you can measure aspect ratios. You know, is this um, outcrop really uh, twice as wide as it is tall or is it three times? Okay, measure the height and then put it into the width. Um, and these are really useful tools um, that I use all the time in observational drawing and in field sketching. And it can also be used to test angles. Similarly, um, we have a very common brain assumption um, that uh, a um, something like the ground, our brain gets lazy, goes, yeah, the ground's flat. Um, actually test that. And, you know, this is really useful in um, uh, drawing interiors, room, by which I mean rooms and things like that. You know, there are a lot of angles looking around you in the room that you might think are flat, but if that's even slightly at an angle to you, it's probably not. And, you know, the test in that, just by holding out your pencil um, along the, the dip of the fault or whatever it might be, and directly transferring that to the paper, you know, it's all about testing your brain's assumptions all the time. Um, so, you know, another thing that I use pretty, pretty often. Um, and here's an example of it again from, um, this is in the Arches Road Cut example from the virtual outcrop tool. Um, and it comes in a lot of use in something like this. You've got all of these fault dips, bedding dips. Um, you can test, it's quite a long outcrop, so you can test the aspect ratio with it. It's a very useful tool um, and I'm happy to um, expand on any of this or, or supply any of this information if you would like. And then finally blocking in. Um, so um, this is something that, you know, this is a, a one of my um, big charcoal drawings, which are my favourites, um, but also this is um, uh, an example, it's from uh, Lara, the London Atelier, um, working from the uh, largest blocks of information into the fine detail rather than going straight to the fine detail. We're also tempted by that juicy looking uh, fault or sedimentary structure. Um, we want to go straight to it, but um, instead, if we force ourselves to work with the widest, the largest blocks, um, it can be, um, and then focus in on the detail, it helps us to get those proportions um, much, much easier. If you're struggling to view um, large blocks um, within, you know, your, your outcrop, um, either take your glasses off um, or uh, half close or squint your eyes um, and definitely try it um, with this or um, I've illustrated it here um, to kind of reduce it to its, its main parts instead of getting lost in all this beautiful cross bedding or whatever the case may be. Um, so um, yeah, this is probably why I got so many wrinkles because um, I spent half my time squinting at um, various outcrops and, and statues and, and whatever. Um, so finally, a worked example of this. Um, what I find in a way to teach this um, is um, that the best way to do it is to force yourself to work in those large blocks. And so um, you restrict yourself effectively. Um, I would always encourage people to start with just 10 lines and really consider the decision making of what are those 10 lines. Um, you know, it can help you again to view the outcrop um, in a different way. It can help you to, you know, really look uh, what you have in front of you to make the decision about what those 10 lines are. And then once that is fully described, add another 10 one, and kind of finish those as a block of 10 and then add the next set and so on and so forth. Um, it is uh, a different way to approach it, um, but again, can lead to uh, good aspect ratios um, and fitting everything in in about the right place, basically. So having gone on about uh, art history a little bit more than I usually would. I think we're getting towards time. And um, this is my last slide, um, which is a bit of a run, I'm afraid, which is just a manifesto for improved field teaching and, and approaching that work in the field. Um, I think it is not great um, for people to talk about the fact that um, the artistic value doesn't matter. You don't have to be good at drawing um, because actually putting a little bit of thought into um, uh, 
observational drawing and, and some of these basic exercises um, does benefit field geologists. So, you know, I've taught this in the field and I have taught it um, online as a, as a kind of virtual outcrop um, uh, workshop within BP. Um, and it does make a difference. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to supply any um, additional information you might need, but if you are in a position to do field work education, um, give people these, these solutions because they do help and they're pretty simple. Um, if you can demonstrate them, do. Um, but as a broader topic, um, this is something that artists have known for an awfully long time and not a, a lot of geologists know about. There is something to be said for working outside the discipline and even outside of what we would consider as science. As I said, observational drawing is developed very much like a science. Um, but um, yeah, we could stand to ask artists a little bit more about this. And then finally, um, this isn't fluff. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a fun Wednesday night talk, um, you know, a, a way to spend an evening, but um, there is um, some solid um, field data collection behind what I'm talking about. Improved field sketching doesn't just give you a pretty notebook. Um, because so much of it is about learning to look, learning to break down our observations um, and separate them from our interpretations, might make us better geologists. Um, so in interest of time, I guess uh, we'll close there. Um, I do have some additional slides I can send them around um, with the other ones if you'd like. Um, but I guess um, I'd be happy to open the floor to questions um, if anyone has any. Uh, so I've got one to start with um, from Ian. Um, which I can um, address while maybe people are thinking about that, I suppose. Um, Ian says, uh, you mentioned field notebooks. Do you use an additional sketchbook that is larger or smaller? So for um, observational drawing, yes, I usually work in an A4 sketchbook because um, that's what fits in my rucksack. And most of my favorite observational drawings are absolutely massive. Um, but, you know, I definitely keep the two separate. Um, field work is field work. Uh, observational drawing is observational drawing. I just work in a chart well. Um, uh, what were the red horizontal lines on all your sketches? That was just the uh, the um, sketchbook that I got. It was one of the yellow chart well ones, but um, it had those lines in it. Um, but you know, I'm not going to waste a good sketchbook. <laughs> I don't think they all have those. Okay. Um, do I have uh, any thoughts on best use of color? What is most visually appealing? Um, that's a really interesting question because um, obviously in terms of um, colour, uh, representative colour, I have an awful lot of thoughts. I've spent most of uh, um, the COVID period working pretty intensely on, on colour mixing and colour theory, but in terms of what serves, um, you know, again, separating aesthetic um, drawing of landscape from a technical drawing of landscape, um, it's got to be about communication, right? So, you know, we've got to work with, there are some really well-established conventions for limestone is blue um, or whatever the case may be. Um, it's about getting that visual information across. I, I, I you know, um, there are things about what might pop. I think that's probably got more to do with what colors you've got and, and how good they are. But um, I would definitely um, uh, re-emphasize um, that it is, not this is not about making pretty field sketches this is about making useful field sketches quickly um can i tell you a bit about your experience with royal drawing school and its impact on your field sketching yes i see um so the royal drawing school i mean i would love to do a full intensive course there one day it is um uh it is a master's level and short course establishment um it used to be called the prince's drawing school um and um it is probably the best place I have found for treating um, people who can't commit to a full blown three years of arts education, treating it like, I'm not here to paint flowers, you know, I'm here to do kind of solid um, observational drawing and to treat it like a, a, a proper artist as much as you like. Um, the short courses are excellent. I've also done something called the Drawing Marathon, which is um, like a very intensive summer course. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of that kind of stuff has to fit around um, uh, my day job, basically. Um, so my, my diploma um, was at University Arts London and was evenings and weekends um, for a few years. Um, and mostly it, it kind of fits into holidays. So I would definitely recommend the Royal Drawing School as it's not cheap, 
Um, it's not the most expensive, but as one of the places that takes observational drawing very seriously. Um, other than that, I can recommend a few online art schools that are um, uh, particularly good um, if you let me know where you are. Um, and best pencil. Oh, good question. Um, well, mostly, um, and I think we've got a couple of BP folks on the line, but mostly the pencils that I use are the mechanical ones that I filch from the BP stationery cupboard in terms of uh, field sketching, because obviously I do my field work uh, for my job. Um, for pencils um, and drawing pencils, um, the number one best pencil for sketching is um, the Palomino Blackwing, and I have one on my desk uh, right in front of me, which is quite handy, um, but they're quite soft. They're too soft to be using for um, uh, field sketching because they're just going to smudge as soon as you work over them. You want a very hard pencil, um, but yeah, these ones don't come cheap. These are about three pound a pop, um, but they are lovely, um, yeah, and I would never go back to other ones for sketching. Uh, I've come across, so I've got a quote from Mike, uh, Mike Jones, hello. Um, I've come across in my old field notebooks. The sketching demonstrates that you weren't bad. Um, something about available time, so um, your writing was better. Yeah, I guess, you know, a, a good field sketch does take time. And I notice when I'm a little bit more out of practice with drawing, I've had a couple of slightly chaotic weeks. Um, when I'm a little bit more out of um, practice with drawing, I'm not drawing every day. You can tell the difference between the quality of what you're doing, even with a couple of weeks off. So, you know, if you are um, spending more time and doing it more regularly, you know, it does it does improve. Um, and, you know, if anyone is, is serious about getting into drawing, um, unfortunately, it's just a lot of, you know, what you would consider drills or exercises or whatever. Um, I have drawn so many blinking uh, jugs and uh, cups and things like that over and over and over again um, because yeah it's it's all about kind of building up practice so I suspect you're right Mike. Um, I'm happy to continue answering questions if anyone has any or wants to come off mute or anything like that um, and I'm happy to stick around as long as you like um, if there's anything else people would like to discuss. Thanks, Emma. I think that was really interesting, um, especially as sort of how you've got the different techniques to cope with our lazy brains in terms of all the different shapes. And um, yeah, I think that point about sort of keeping at drawing and keeping on going and doing it is really, really important because I think if you, if you get out of practice, then you can find that you're doing bad drawings again. So, yes, very um, useful. Sorry, I'm just going back to my contact details if anyone wants to follow up on anything. Um, but yeah, other than that, thank you very much um, for your time. Um, so um, Patrick uh, would be interested in recommended online drawing courses. Um, well, if you know, it doesn't matter where you're based, if that's the case, um, the Royal Drawing School does do um, some excellent online courses, particularly summer. So they do kind of week long short courses. Um, I would definitely recommend um, some of them are, are very well themed. Um, there are also um, uh, Draw Brighton. Um, is a very, very good, it's very figure based, but not exclusively. Um, yeah, so Draw Brighton, they have, um, if anyone's familiar with Patreon, um, they have a lot, they, you know, basically you pay them an amount of money and they make a lot of resources and education available. We definitely recommend them. Um, and then finally, if you're into a bit more of experimental drawing, there is a wonderful resource called Drawing is Free, um, uh, which is free. Um, and has lots of really fun exercises um, to kind of take drawing beyond the representational. Um, additional to that, um, over the last 18 months, I did um, for an entire, yeah, I think I did about 60 or 70 um, free uh, one hour drawing classes on a Thursday evening called Thursday Night Drawing Club. Um, if you go to the link um, from my Instagram, and if you're not familiar with Instagram, I can um, message you the link more directly. Uh, but the recordings of all of those classes, many of which are geologically themed, um, are available uh, on there. So there's recordings of lots and lots of one hour classes. Um, if you want to hear me yammer on a little bit more. And, and Emma, as you, you said that we'd be able to send the slides over for people to use the resource. So I think what we'll try and do is when we send the link out for the recording, um, mm -hmm. we'll see if we can try and attach the file as a PDF to see if anyone wants to pick out that way. So assuming it's not massive. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll switch it up if it is, no problem. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll get it we'll get it to people. And if we can't, um, I can just email it direct to people. That's no problem. If we can't attach it to anything. Thank you. It was it was very interesting talk. Um, could I ask everyone to sort of unmute themselves and have a little bit of a clap? Because I think oh. that's, that's very good. That's what we try and do. So oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Beep, beep. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Um, have a lovely evening. Thank you. And thank you once again for coming to talk to us. It was fascinating. Good fun. Always good fun. I'll talk about this to anyone, whether they want me to or not. <laughs> Okay, well, I will, I will call it at an end. And yep. thank you again. We'll try and circulate the recording around later. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.